one of the subjects that um, is scarcely touched on in uh, Christian discussions, particularly in public, is the subject of sexuality, the subject of sex, the subject of intimacy in marriage. What is strange is that uh, while this uh, subject is shunned to be discussed in public, it is one of the act in which, one of the acts in which uh, all married people or married people are expected to engage in. And uh, truth be told, even unmarried people engage in sex. So it becomes important, very important, for us to understand what does the Bible say about sexuality? What does God expect of his children about this special gift? And so it's my intention to spend time just to highlight on the subject of sexuality. And um, the intention is for us to understand God's intention for people to engage in, in sex. Now, I have uh, written this statement so that uh, you don't get offended. This presentation is for adults and the purpose is to communicate a biblical view of sexuality. So I guess if you are a Bible student, if you are a Christian, be comfortable, be in the comfort zone. This, is, this will not stray because the purpose is to communicate a biblical view of sexuality. The best people to watch and listen to this video are those who are married, who want to get married, and who just want to understand the gift of sexuality from or by God. I guess this includes quite a good number of you, uh, those of you that are married, those of you that want to get married, and those of you that just want to know what God's will is about marriage. First of all, it must be understood that sex is a gift from God. Sex is a gift from God. Sexuality, which is the state of feeling sexual, and wanting to engage in the act of sex is a God-given gift to humanity. It is one of the best gifts as it heals man and woman to a certain extent. Summed up, sexuality is good. As a matter of fact, very good. I'm speaking from experience. Obviously, I'm a married person, and uh, one of the beautiful gifts that a person can enjoy is the gift of sex, sexuality, sex in marriage. Um, take note of the comment. The main thought here is sex is a gift from God. What are the implications of uh, sex being a gift from God? The implications are that then we, God's children, must know that uh, sex is not something that uh, we need to shy away from, something we don't want to discuss, something we want to shelve, uh, something we want to, to hide from even children from knowing that there is such a gift from God, because a gift from God is something beautiful. And, and that, this is very profound because uh, one of the reasons why uh, sex has been kept out of public discussions is because people just kind of feel like, ah, this is, this is 
It's almost like, you know, when we sin, we hide. And so when people engage in uh, sex because it's done in private, people think it should not even be discussed. But that is not the case and the intention of God. And so we continue. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 to 19, has these words. And I love these words. It says, drink water from your own system, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now listen to this, this, this last part, which I put in, 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 in yellow marks. A loving doll, that's describing a wife, a loving doll, a graceful dear, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. This is intimate language that the Bible is using here. The Bible is, is describing, and I'm so glad that uh, Solomon was able to put this in scripture because it demystifies and it removes sex from a taboo. It puts it as something beautiful. I love the statement, may her breasts satisfy you. May you ever be intoxicated. <laughs> when I uh, think of uh, intoxication, there is intoxication through alcohol. There is intoxication through the act of sex, the act of lovemaking. The Bible says, may your wife's breast, the wife of your youth, may they captivate you. May they stimulate you. May her love intoxicate you. Um, you know, when the Bible describes this, it simply raises sexuality to a platform where we are not to shun sexuality. We are, on the contrary, to actually appreciate sexuality. Continues on to say in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, 21 to 23, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And when God made this helper who was suitable for the man and brought the woman, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Nakedness in marriage, nakedness before your partner is not something that should be uh, under darkness. No, sexuality in marriage is a gift from God. And God says the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now, it's interesting that the Bible does indicate and qualifies that sex is between a man and a woman. I know I might be stepping on a lot of toes, particularly in this, in the modern generation in which uh, people accommodate other styles of life. Now, let me make sure I am not condemning those other lifestyles that people choose, but I have an obligation to describe what the Bible says. 
That's what I follow as a Christian. If somebody is not a Christian and they engage in something outside of the biblical prescriptions or descriptions, that's up to them. But here's what the Bible says. God intended sex to be between married people, a man and a woman. The creation of the human sexual organs in man and in woman suggests that sex was meant to be between a man and a woman. Now, there are three points here that I would like to stress. First of all, the point that marriage is between a man and a woman. That's what the Bible says, and I will provide a biblical basis for that. But then secondly, it further on by creation. Now I'm talking maybe as a biologist, as one who has studied the anatomy and the physiology of the reproductive system. The way God created a man with his sexual organs and a woman with her sexual organs, they complement each other and hence it just makes sense that God meant sex to be between a man and a woman. Now, I will go ahead and share biblical texts. The God or God's approved sex is maybe described in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 to 2. I'll double check that verse. No, it's not 1 to 2. It's a little bit down, but it's in chapter 7. It says, but since sexual immorality is not occur, is, is occurring, that's now Paul writing to the Corinthians, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Here is a text that clearly says and stipulates that the intent in the biblical, in the mind of Christian mindset is between a husband and a wife, that is a man and a woman. Secondly, in Genesis chapter two, verse 24, it says this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. It is a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, who become one flesh in the act of marriage. What are the reasons that God gave us sex? Why did God give us this beautiful gift of sexuality, intimacy, there are two reasons that the Bible provides. Number one is procreation. The Bible says God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1 verse 28. So we engage in sex for the sake of having children. That's one of the primary reasons why God gave the gift of sexuality. To humanity. But I won't end there. There is another reason for the gift of sex. It's for enjoyment. For enjoyment. Any married man, any married woman who has engaged in sex, rightly done, there is no experience on earth that is as sweet as engaging in sex. Now, the anatomy and creation of human sexual organs support the idea of enjoyment. You know, I don't want to be too, too graphic here, but you study the anatomy of a woman's sexual organs. You study the anatomy of a man's sexual organs. There are some parts of those sexual organs that are put there, not necessarily for procreation, because procreation can happen, but they are meant there for enjoyment. 
you know, procreation, there is only about 25 years, a 25 year window for children from the time uh, a, child, a girl starts uh, producing the eggs to maybe 45 or so, some even 40 years, and they stop having kids. So then what happens after that? This is why God's gift was not intended to just be for procreation, the having of children. No, no husband, no wife. The gift of sexuality, the gift of sex in marriage was meant for enjoyment. I will say that as if I am saying salvation is through Christ Jesus our Lord just as important as the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation is important. So it is for us to get the correct concept of sexuality. Sexuality is a gift from God for us to produce children. And I have four. Sexuality is also a gift for us to just enjoy. Dear husband, dear wife, I want you to catch, catch this. Sex is not something you should dread. Sex is something you should look forward to when the time comes, engage in it. God put all the sexual organs there for your enjoyment. And yes, sex is very good. That's why even unmarried people are tempted to engage in sex because it is good. It's a gift from God. Let's continue. First Corinthians supports this idea very strongly. Chapter 7, verse 3 to 6. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. I, I want to just maybe speak a little stronger on this text by making sure that Married people understand, husbands understand that you have an obligation to fulfill a marital duty. Sexuality is viewed as a marital duty. You have a duty as a husband to satisfy your wife through the act of love making. Wife, you have a duty to satisfy your husband through the act of love, through sexuality. The Bible reached the extent of saying, a man's body should be yielded to the desire of the wife. A woman's body should be yielded to the desire of the wife. That's what the Bible says. This business of husbands and wives determining and depriving each other have consequences even among Christians. Now, it's interesting to notice that when the Bible stresses this point, healed your body, it continues to teach us the implication of regularity in marriage, in sex. God expects married people to engage in sex regularly. Regularity or regularly means as often as they desire and is practical. I'm not going to tell you here the Bible does not say how many times you should engage in lovemaking in sex, but the Bible teaches regularity in sex or in engaging in lovemaking is wholesome, is healthy for healthy marriages. And what is regularity? It is as often as you desire 
and as often as is practical. Now, it's very interesting what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6 says about this business of regularity or depriving each other. It says, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The Bible is clear. Husband, wife, please listen. The Bible says only by mutual consent because you want to engage in exercises like prayer, fasting, when you have devoted your time to God. But even then, Paul says, don't let that fasting and that prayer now last forever and deprive. Come back together again. And if you don't come back together, you are likely going to be tempted to the extent that you will find yourselves into or in troubles. That's what the Bible says. Otherwise, Satan will tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Let me just let me just think what this could have meant. When people have been married, they are they get used to having sex in marriage. Their bodies gets adjusted to regarding sex as part of what is wholesome and good. And when, for some reasons, you pull apart together, you're not having sex together, you have created a very strong temptation because the craving that has been created by regularity and healthy sex will need to be fulfilled. Very good. Now, let me give you a warning. This is a warning in red. A sexually deprived marriage is in danger, very serious danger of breaking up by either partner seeking sex outside of marriage or divorce itself. Now, I am say, I'm, I'm sounding this to you so that you take this seriously. I mean, we, we've been looking at biblical text. A sexually deprived marriage is in danger. And the dangers, I can almost, you know, in mathematics, we predict the results. I can almost predict a sexually deprived marriage. When married people deprive themselves of sex, they will result in two things. Partner will become unfaithful or that marriage will actually end in divorce. Commentary that I have made on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36, about the sexual drive. Some people underestimate the sexual drive. I almost wanted to say, they want to Christianize, Christianize things they should not, um, they should not take as trivial and, and, and think they are not important. This sexual drive, which is God implanted in man, is very strong that when and where it is missing, people masturbate or engage in unhealthy practices. I am telling what happens in marriages that are sexually deprived or in, uh, or in, uh, in marriages that are just totally out of sync with biblical views. The Bible says if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin. In other words, if, if you find yourself, the drive is too strong. It says, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do so. He should do as he wants, he's not sinning. I'm just taking this from the scripture. In other words, when the sexual drive becomes very strong and it can be strong, just take a wife. 
take a husband because it's part of how God created human beings. How often should sex be performed? How often should people engage in sex? There are certain factors that are considered. Now, this is more at practical level. The following are some of the factors. Number one, the age. If people are young, they might engage more in sex than people who are advanced in age. And, and the reason is not like, uh, therefore, those who are advanced in age don't have sexual rights, no. It's just because they have learned to, 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 to schedule things in a much more healthy manner than the younger ones. So age is a contributing factor. Health, are they healthy physically or not? When people are not healthy physically, the sexual drive can be very minimal, it can be almost starved. I guess I'm sharing this so that you don't quickly judge your partner because it could be he or she is not engaging regularly in sex because of healthy reasons. Are they together or not? Physical location. You know, physical location will determine how often you can have sex. I'll tell you a story. One day I met a lady in, uh, in America, in Washington, D.C., who said to me that she was working in Washington for about two years by that time, but that she had a husband back home in Zambia. And then she said, Pastor, I'm so worried about him. So I said, what are you worried about? Well, I'm worried that he might be tempted to, to go out with other women. I almost called her a fool. I almost called her a fool. Because I wanted to say to her, and what are you doing here these two years? And your husband is alone. Don't take me there. So let me stop and just go to the next point. Next point is, do they have a high sexual appetite or not? Sexual appetite is just what it is. There are some people who really have a very strong desire for sex. To them, sex can be more regular than those whose appetite is average or whose appetite is low. That's another reason. The other one, does their spouse want more or less sex? In marriage, if your spouse, be it your wife or your husband, wants more sex, you are likely to have more sex because the spouse wants it and your body is not yours. It also belongs to her or to him. Isn't this interesting to know? Let's go to what the Bible says about um, uh, being temperate. Because you know, some people may take even good things to bad extremes. Married people, therefore, should not starve each other. The husband should free her body for the wife at any time she wants, and the wife should do the same. Just make sure that you do not do it excessively to where one of you starts to hate and hate it. This is an, a statement intended to bring about temperance. Even good thing, temperance is defined as doing in moderate ways, even those things that are good. This is particularly caution for young people for young couples that have just married. The Bible says, therefore, in Exodus 20, verse 14, God expects married people to be faithful to one another by not engaging in sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of marriage breaks the one bond that should not be broken. And if it is broken, this is one act where even the Bible if forgiveness is possible, allows a person to divorce. You shall not commit adultery, the Bible says. Let me explain this. God expects married people to be faithful. 
And speaking of being faithful, it is, it's extremely important to be faithful in marriage because if sex is so intimate with the other person, that when you engage in it with another person outside of marriage, they have, you've equated them to your husband or to your wife. This is one area where the Bible says, if you cannot forgive, then you may even divorce. Adultery is not allowed in scripture. Matthew 19, verse 7 to 9 says, when, why then, they asked Jesus, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and sends her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. You see here, only sexual immorality, that's adultery, sex outside marriage is the only exception in the eyes of God that he gave for divorce. This is how important God views faithfulness in marriage. Let me talk about age and sexuality, gray hair and sexuality. Sexual desire or drive does not stop because one is 60 or more. Actually, sex may even be sweeter at 60 and above because you have gained experience on how to perform good sex. Ooh, let me, let me unload this. Let me unload this. You know, one of the reasons why we don't believe, and the Bible doesn't teach that sexuality is for procreation only, having children, is because after your wife stops having children, you now have the time to enjoy sexuality, to enjoy lovemaking. When you turn 60, it doesn't mean the act should be deprived in marriage. As a matter of fact, use all your experience, all your, all your years of experience in lovemaking to even make it much sweeter, much happier, much healthier. Maybe you should just, when you wake up on that Sunday morning, just lie side by side with your wife and just ah, fly away. <laughs> <laughs> the gift of sexuality is so beautiful and so wonderful and so much a gift from God. As I end this presentation, I would like to make some major statements that we have covered. Number one, sexuality or the act of sex is a gift from God implanted in the very nature of man and woman, created with, se with sexual organs that are intended to enhance lovemaking, both for procreation as well as for enjoyment. Just make sure you have sex to the right person, your spouse. Just make sure you don't deprive yourself of the gift of sex or lovemaking. And to those of us enjoying the privilege and opportunity of gray hair, hey, sex doesn't end because you are 60. It is perfected at 60. <laughs> sex is perfected at 60. <laughs>